Alrighty, Earth Science, let's talk some earthquakes. Uh, we're going to do all of the basic earthquake stuff today, the essentials, um, and then we will go into some more stuff next week using the ESRT, um, trying to figure out how far epicenters are away from the station, and then figuring out um, where an epicenter is. Um, so, without further ado, let's get into it. So, earthquakes, biggest things you should know. Is that one, um, earthquakes happen when the crust of the earth moves, right? We've talked about plate boundaries, we've talked about some tectonic plate stuff. Um, earthquakes happen as a result of this movement. This movement um, releases energy and that energy um, causes the shaking of the lithosphere. So what's happening is we're actually sending waves through our litho lithosphere, which well, we live on, and we can feel those um, waves. The energy that it is stored, that then gets released in the earthquakes, um, is potential energy. So uh, potential energy is stored energy. It's energy that um, can be used, um, but isn't currently quote unquote in use. And so it has the potential for you. So the potential to do work, uh, which you will talk about a lot in physics as, as we get further, and actually even in biology and chemistry, potential energy and energy in general is a, a core to science. And um, last but not least, earthquakes happen primarily on plate boundaries. Now that's where they they start. That's where their focus or the epicenter is. Um, but obviously, as they send waves outwards, they can influence a lot um, more areas than just on the actual plate boundary. So that's where they start and then they move uh, from there. So two big terms that we have to talk about with earthquakes that I've already started using. Um, the first is a focus point or a focus. That is the point inside of the earth where the earthquake occurs. The actual point right here where on the fault line the earthquake occurs. And then from the focus point, moving directly up from there, we have what we call the epicenter, which is the point exactly where the focus is, but on our surface. So you can't go to the focus point, uh, but you can go to a, an epicenter. And when you're standing on the epicenter, you say directly below me, wherever directly below me hits that fault line, that is where the earthquake actually occurred. That's where the first slip happened, which then sent waves um, outwards from there. Okay, so two major points, the focus and the epicenter. Cool. So, when we're talking about waves, there are two main types of waves that we talk about. Uh, the first are called P waves. Now, scientists are efficiently uncreative. They like to name things based off of uh, this specific category that they're talking about. So P waves are called P waves because they are primary waves. They are the first waves that happen um, and they move faster, or they, they're the first waves that hit you, and because of their speed, they arrive first. Um, P waves can travel, very importantly, through solids and liquids, and they travel faster through dense materials. Now, these are all really important points. They travel really fast, they're compressional waves, and they travel through solids and liquids, and they travel fastest through dense materials because, obviously, there's... Um, well, another type of wave, if there's a primary wave, well, it's going nice and slow. The secondary waves, well, guess what? They go slower than P waves um, and can only travel through solids. So P waves, solids and liquids, S waves only through solids. Um, and because they are slower, they are going to arrive after the P waves. Now, uh, we call these shear waves or... Um, you could call them transverse waves. That's a, a very common phrase in um, physical science. Um, essentially, it's just shaking a different way than the compressional waves. And we'll talk about that a lot more as we go down further your science path. So we have P waves, we have S waves. The reason why these are important is because we call areas on Earth, um, they could be in the shadow zone. So. The Earth doesn't have a consistent density all the way through. The inner core is liquid, 
And so if we have P waves that can travel through liquid and S waves that cannot travel through liquid, they'll, there's going to be parts of the Earth where you only get P waves because the S waves are being quote unquote blocked by the liquid inside of Earth's core. And so that area where it's being blocked is what we call the shadow zone. Now mind you, the waves can also bend based off of their the, dis, the density differences in the Earth, and so we'll talk about that a little bit. But it is so important to realize that the P waves, well, they can go through whatever they want. The S waves can't. And so that leaves a zone where you only get P waves here, but no S waves. Okay? So this is like the, the end all be all one slide of everything. P waves, primary waves, travel through solids and liquids, arrive first. S waves, secondary waves, solids only, can only travel through solids, and arrive second. Um, measuring earthquakes, well, we're going to talk about the different scales that we measure earthquakes. Um, I can't stress enough the things that I just said. It should be a really, really great key to you to notice that when I say things four or five times, those are the, the really big key points that we got to pull from this the P waves and S waves. Now let's talk about how we measure earthquakes. So the first is the modified Mercalli scale. The modified Mercalli scale is a subjective scale based off of how much damage the earthquake causes. Um, so it can happen from 1 to 12, um, 12 being complete total damage, objects thrown all over the place, where a 1 can be not felt. Um, and so the reason why this is subjective is because see, some people can um, experience certain differences in um, damage caused. Uh, one house might be destroyed while another house might be, and so it's a little bit more, it can, it can have a range to it, um, whereas our other scales, there's not as much of a range. So modified Mercalli intensity is based off of the quote-unquote devastation. The other type that we're going to be talking about is the Richter scale, which is the most common um, one that people will like to hear a lot. Um, and it's specifically the amount of energy released by the earthquake. So this is a more quantifiable scale. The scale ranges from 0 to 9, but here's the thing. It's not a linear scale. It's, ex it's exponential if um, you've kind of explored that a little bit in math. Um, but essentially, um, like for instance, a magnitude 6 is 32 times more powerful than a magnitude 5. The scale is not completely linear. It's not like a, a, a 2 is half as much as a 4. Um, and so getting up to those higher 8s and 9s um, would be complete and utter devastation. Um, and so that's kind of how the scale looks. And so we have things like 0 to 1.9 can be detected only by a seismograph, but not by us. But then you hit the 7s, the 8s, the 9s. Um, between a 7 and a 7.9 is a pretty huge difference. Um, and it could be the difference between, um, well, some homes being destroyed and um, complete devastation. Um, and we measure all these with a seismograph. Um, which prints out the vibrations. It's the one that looks very similar to a lie detector, um, and I'll throw that in our um, Schoology page as well, a picture of a seismograph. Alrighty, that's all I wanted to cover today. It's going to be nice and quick, uh, small set of notes here, and um, hopefully you guys enjoyed the mustache because it's probably going away. Um, but other than that, uh, have a good one. Stay healthy. See you guys later.